You are listening to the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. We'll get to the show right after this. Journey into the unknown, the unexplored, the unexplained Ecto Portal. Every Wednesday, we unravel the mysteries and histories of our paranormal world. But, and, I, and my father then became a psychic, and I have family members who are healers and mediums. So. Thelema is designed to free people. Here are the tools by which to be an individual. You have to think of why they came to us when animals appear to us for a reason. It's maybe what we're dealing with in our life. That's what animal communication is. But any biochemist, any chemical laboratory will tell you that the genetic codes are the same. It's the same here and the same across the cosmos. Our show is not just for those that believe, but for those who want to take a closer look. Join us for Ectoportal at www.ectoportal.podbean.com. Also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and YouTube. Welcome to another episode of The Unseen Paranormal, where some of the scariest things are unseen. I'm your host, Eric Freeman. On today's show, we are talking to Mike Sears. Mike is the founder and director of Volunteer State Paranormal Research. He has been a guest on multiple TV programs, including Tennessee Crossroads and Travel Channel's Most Terrifying Places in America, and various radio shows, including Midnight in the Desert. Mike has published several articles in Visions, Chad is Fate, and Unex News magazines about his experiences with the paranormal when he was young. How are you doing today, Mike? Doing good. Thank you for having me as a guest on the show. Ah, thanks for joining me. So how did you get started in the paranormal? Well... At age five, I saw my first ghost. It was a little girl in a Victorian dress when I lived in upstate New York near the uh, Finger Lakes region area. That spiked the interest as a kid. You know, I would watch documentaries and books on it. But, you know, I had parents at the time that were very skeptical and thought it was an act of imagination that I had. And then uh, in 1994, my dad was battling cancer. And uh, June of 94, his health had really gotten bad, and we had brought in hospice. He was in a coma for um, about five days, and um, they, the hospice nurse, due to his body temperature, net, thought that he was going to pass away that night, and they were scheduled to be off, and they offered to stay. And my mom says, "No, that's okay. We should handle it, and if anything changes, we'll, we'll you know, we'll call you." So um, my mom was at his bedside, and about three o'clock in the morning, he uh, passed away. She grieved there for about a half hour and she went over to wake me up to go to my room to let me know that he had passed away. And before she could leave the room, my dad had sat up out of the bed and said, whoa, where are you going? I need to talk to you, which shocked her. You know, he hadn't talked in a week and, and for the, most of the month of June, he could just barely talk you know, due to his health. She was shocked to see, you know, the color in his face, he, you know, looked healthy. And he said, look, uh, I begged them to asked me to come back. You know, I wanted to come back and to let you and Mike know that uh, everything is going to be okay and that you shouldn't worry about me. And so they ended up talking till about seven in the morning. My mom says she couldn't see people in the room, but she said she could feel like this energy presence there. Like she could feel like she was being watched, but my dad could see him and he was talking to past relatives and people he had known in the military and um, interpreted back and forth to my mom. And one of them was his first wife, who he had uh, met in Japan when he was stationed in Japan. And she was Japanese, and uh, she passed away in the early 60s from cancer. He spoke fluent Japanese and interpreted back and forth to my mom and her. She had thanked my mom for taking care of my dad on our side, and she was going to take care of him on the other side, and there was nothing to worry about. So she came and woke me up. And told me that my dad wanted to talk to me, which, you know, was a big shocker. And uh, I went to go see him in the hospital bed and he wasn't there. And she says, no, he's not there. He's in his own bed. And he had got up on his own, took a shower, dressed himself and got in his own bed. I was totally in shock when I walked in to see him. We, we talked for a while and he says, well, I guess we're done. And and he goes, you got any questions? And I said, I can't think of any. You know, I wish I could have asked you to help me, you know learn how to work on cars and stuff like that. My dad was like, 
very protective of his tools and pretty strict. You know, he was 22 years in the army. So I had said, you know, you had it pretty rough. He's like, I haven't had it rough. And I said, well, who's had it rougher than you? You've been battling cancer for quite a while. And he's like, uh, Jesus had. And I was like, wow, my dad was not a churchgoer. And if I heard Jesus from him, he was usually, you know, cursing. To him to say that blew me away. So he had said that uh, he was ready to go. So my mom and I just said, we don't know how that works. I guess you just got to go back to sleep. So he went to sleep about 11 o'clock. He uh, woke up yelling out. We came to check on him and he was surprised to see us and that he was still there. And uh, so my mom says, maybe they're giving you a free pass. So he's like, well, I'm starving. Make me something. So my mom's offering, you know, milkshake or um, a smoothie or soup because he'd been on a liquid diet for almost a month. And he's like, no, I want some real food. And so I ran down to Publix and I ended up seeing they had some crawfish and they ended up buying crawfish, corn on the cob and some steak and beer. And I said, you know, that's what I would want for a last meal. And I'm sure he would. And so I brought that back and he was walking around the house and he helped me cook the meal. And we ended up having the whole entire day together. And uh, we went through family movies and photo albums and talked. And about midnight, he was exhausted. He, he said if he didn't wake up in the next morning that he just wanted us to know that he loved us and that everything was going to be okay. So uh, the next morning, the doorbell rang and it was hospice. And my mom came to get me and she's like, hospice at the door. And I said, okay, let him in. And she goes, no, you don't understand. Your dad's in his own bed. How are we going to explain this? And I said, well, just tell him. And when they came in, we're, they were all upset that he wasn't in the hospital bed. They thought that we physically dragged him and put him in his own bed and that we wanted him to die in his bed, not the hospital bed. We explained that he had came back to life and spent the day with us. They didn't believe us. And so we just let it go. And my dad passed away for the second time three days later. So that was a big uh, life-changing experience there. After that, in August of the same year, I had a paranormal encounter with a, with a haunting. I was woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I thought someone had broken in the house. And I could feel presence in my bedroom. And I tried to turn on my uh, light on my bed and reach for my pistol. And I used to be a police officer in the Air Force. I slept with a gun. Before I could get to it, someone grabbed me by the ankles and started dragging me out of the bed. I broke free, climbed back up the bed. And before I could get to the headboard, someone jumped on my back and pushed my face into the pillow. And I'm screaming in the pillow, trying to let my mom know that someone's in the house. I was living at home with her. I finally broke free. Got the light on, grabbed my gun. Nobody was there. <laughs> wow. I'm like, what the hell? Yeah, I'm like, what the hell's going on? So I went to go wake her up and uh, tell her what just happened. And she's thinking I'm having PTSD flashbacks from the Gulf War. And I, I was in Desert Shield and Storm. And uh, I said, no, it's nothing like that. And so she's like, well, let me uh, go wake up, you know, wash my face to freshen up and tell me what happened. So she comes out of the restroom. I hear something come down the hallway. I thought it was my dog. I had an, uh, an Akita, which is like a big Husky. And I heard, you know, footsteps come down the hallway and I could feel someone like coming, but I couldn't see anyone. And then this big force of energy hit me square in the chest, like someone tackled me in football, lifted me off the floor and threw me about eight to 10 feet back and hit into her bedroom wall. And she was like, oh, my God, are you OK? She goes, did you lose your balance? And I'm like, how do I lose my balance from way over there to come to here? I said, there's no way. I it was just attacked. I said, I'm telling you, it's, a, you know, it's attacking me again, whatever it is. And I was attacked for probably about a half hour nonstop on and off. And she would witness the hair on my arms and chest and on my head just start raising up in the air. And she would touch me and she could feel the electrical charge where, you know, the hair on her arms would stand up and her hair. And, and as soon as I said it let go, the feeling would go away. And then I would say, I'm being attacked again. It felt like someone was hugging me in a, like a bear hug. She was pretty calm through it all. And she was a, she's a school teacher. And she actually pulled out blood pressure gauge that my dad had used, started taking my blood pressure. And when I was being attacked, my blood pressure was extremely high. And when it released me, my blood pressure was normal. And she's like, that's just crazy. I, I don't know why it would do that. It shouldn't be doing that. So after a half hour, it had ended. We went to go look for my dog. She was cowering underneath the kitchen table, scared to death. During it, my mom recorded it. She pulled it. She couldn't keep up notes. So she pulled out her tape recorder. She had this mini cassette tape recorder she used for taking notes, teaching. 
the next day we played it and we heard a, like a gruffy voice going off when um, it was attacking me. So she called my grandmother, her mom, to tell her what had happened that night. And as they were talking, I got attacked again. Felt like someone was grabbing me in a bear hug where I had total paralysis. I couldn't talk. And all I could do was just get my mouth open and moan type of deal. And she came over and broke out in prayer and it let go of me. And, and that ended that. But the haunting ended up lasting for six years. Uh, 94 to 95 was the most extreme time period where I was attacked multiple times in bed. Sometimes I come home from work and walk in the door and you can just feel that energy. I'd be thrown into a wall or something would be thrown at me. Um, we brought over multiple clergy, we even went to a Catholic church and tried to get them to do an exorcism on the house. But due to us not being Catholic, they wouldn't do it. We finally, uh, my mom had a student that was a Native American Indian and his dad was a medicine man. And uh, she contacted him and he came over and did a cleansing ceremony that lasted for about eight hours. And nothing happened for a full year after he did the cleansing ceremony. He had taught me a lot during the cleansing ceremony, told me not to fear it and stand up to it. So the year the year went by, my mom went on vacation, so I had the house to myself. About three o'clock in the morning, I got woken up with my dog jumping on my bed, scared to death. And then every door in the house that I could see was opening and closing super fast, nonstop. And I screamed out, you know, I said, bring it. You know, I was cursing and cussing. I said, I'm not afraid of you anymore. Let's get this over. It stopped. And then after that, it was just little things. But before we had the Native American Indian, we had a psychic medium that I had met. And she was pretty amazing. My mom and I, after my dad had passed away, we were driving around and she saw a sign that says, oh, wow, psychic bear. She goes, I've never been to one of those. And I said, well, do you want me to pull in? She's like, yeah, let's check it out. And I was kind of skeptical. They had we go in and they had 25 psychics and mediums there. And they said, just pick whoever on the list. And it's twenty five dollars for 15 minutes. And uh, so I they asked if I wanted one. And I said, well, if you got any that have actually worked with law enforcement, then I'll take that one. But if you don't, then I'm not interested. And they go, ah, we actually have a lady that's worked with the state police and sheriff's office. And I said, all right, I'll take her. So I met her and she was pretty amazing. I you know, just told her, I'm not telling you nothing. You tell me. And she was nailing things, you know, exactly. It was really amazing. So I contacted her later on and said, hey, look, we're having this stuff happening in the house. Would you be interested in um, helping us? And she's like, well, I can't remove it, but I could tell you what it is. And I was like, "Okay." So she came over and she lit this six inch circumference candle in the living room on the coffee table and asked us if we had any other candles. And I said, well, we have these little tea votive candles. And she says, yeah, I like those. And I said, do you want me to put them across our fireplace mantle? She's like, yeah, that's a good place. So I lit those. And she was telling us candles can be used as detect energy in the room. And she says by the growth of the flame. So she was going around doing the reading of the house. And she asked for a Bible. My mom goes, well, we have this big family Bible. And it weighs a little over six pounds. And she said, uh, open that up and put it on Mike's bed. And then she asked me to go get some paper to cut some crosses and stuff. So, uh. I uh, did that. And while I was away, my mom and one of our friends who we invited over to be a witness during the meeting was there. They said my bedroom got ice, ice cold and the Bible's pages started changing, you know, flipping on their own like a fan was hitting. And then the Bible lifted off my bed and slammed shut. And then the bedroom door slammed in front of their face. And I hear them scream. So I come running over and they told me what happened. And so we opened the bedroom door again and she's like, open the Bible and start reading from it. So I open it and lay back on the bed and sure enough, the pages start flipping again and it levitated. So I stepped out of the room and we're all outside in the hallway watching it and it slammed shut and fell back down on the bed. And she's like, I'm out of here. So she she goes, I'm sorry, you're going to need clergy. I can't help you. And uh, she uh, went out to get her big candle and the whole candle, this six inch circumference candle, was totally melted on the table. And I looked, I go, wow, are those tea candles supposed to be doing that? And there was about six to eight tea candles on the fireplace and the flames on them were all about a foot high. And, and she was like, <laughs> I'm out of here. And she ran out the door. And uh, so my mom and I didn't get any sleep, I don't think, that night. Um, our friend ended up leaving. She was too scared to stay the night. But uh, yeah, it was pretty crazy. So that made me a hardcore believer of the paranormal. And 
when I moved to Tennessee in 2005, our house was haunted, which was like, oh crap, I'm going, I'm going to go through another haunting. I saw a full body apparition on the second day we moved in the house, which was a woman in a white dress. And that inspired me to, to learn more on the afterlife. That and the paranormal shows I saw on TV. I didn't see them really helping the people or calming them down on most of them. I could relate to what some of these people were going through. So I decided to get into paranormal research and help families and let them know that this stuff is real, that they're not alone, that they're not crazy. So ever since then, since 2006, I've just been heavily going into helping families and investigating locations on spirit activity. Yeah. And uh, you have an amazing, incredible story that I just find fascinating. And, and also, who better to help people who are having those type of experiences in their home than somebody who's been through the worst of the worst of it that you can possibly imagine? Yeah. When I talk to clients, they always go, we have an extreme haunting. And I go, well, what's extreme? And they're like, well, we had a door close and I might have seen the shadow go across the wall. And I'm like, well, that's, that's nothing. That's, that's not extreme. <laughs> <laughs> right. Extreme is when you're being physically grabbed and thrown into walls and dragged out of bed. Right. And, and unfortunately today with the, with some of the paranormal shows, you know, they, they see all this drama on TV and I think it just hypes it up to where they think, you know, oh, it must be a demon, you know, because you got people on TV getting possessed every episode. Yeah. The, the haunting though, after my dad's death, the medium, she said it was linked to my dad's past that my dad was involved in uh, secret stuff in Vietnam. And my dad was with Mac V and, um, she said that he, he must have worked with something covert. So my mom and I were like, yeah, OK. And so we brought in another psychic medium. She had the same reading. So we we're like, wow, something's got to be to it. So I started reaching out to some people that knew my dad. And they said, yeah, your dad worked in, you know, special ops. In that. And I said, well, his, you know, paperwork says he was a uh, military police for 13 years. And then for the rest of the time in the military, it was logistics supply. My mom said before they got married, he had asked her, how would you like to be married to someone if they were in the CIA? And my mom's like, no, I don't think that's a good thing for a family man. So she said it was never brought up again. And years of research and looking back on things, we found out my dad was good friends with Colby, who was the director of the CIA during the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, my dad was part of the Phoenix program. And according to the medium, three guys wanted to go do a mission on personal gain to do like robbing for gold or something. So my dad wasn't going to partake in that. My dad supposedly was, you know, for God country and apple pie type of deal. And they went on it and got killed and they were pissed off that he survived and they didn't. So they had been haunting him since Vietnam. We always chalked it up as nightmares and it, you know, were really violent nightmares um, was PTSD from the war. And I'm sure some of it was, but, they said they were haunting him and they were uh, upset that he crossed over. So they were taking it out on me. And then uh, a few years ago, I did some research and confirmed, you know, the rumors about my dad and found out, yeah, he was part of that. Wow. Yeah. That's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, it was an eye opener. My mom was shocked. You know, she's like, they were married, uh, almost 30 years. And she's like, you know, you think you know someone <laughs> Right. <laughs> he kept it pretty secret, you know? And then I said, well, it's interesting. I said, you know, you look back and she goes, yeah, we're pretty naive. You know, I said, why would someone that supposedly was the rank of E7 Sergeant first class in the army, you know, we constantly had officers over for dinner, you know, full bird colonels. And, and they were, all, most of them were, you know, special forces, green berets that we used to have over. And then why, why would, why would he be friends with the director of the CIA? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, it's weird to think that, you know, your dad had this whole other life kind of that you didn't know about until after his passing. Yeah. So in uh, in 2009, you founded uh, Volunteer State Paranormal Research. Yes. And you've been going, um, going with that ever since and, and investigating lots of different places. Yeah, we've, we've done a lot of a, a, I try to focus on, you know, like his, I'm a big history buff. So I try to do historical locations and we've been asked to invest you know quite a few of them ripaville was our first big historical one i had met um the docent there chuck Byrne, and he had said that the board was interested in having confirmation because a lot of the docents there and staff had had paranormal activity and witness stuff and they wanted to have confirmation of it you know through a team and uh it was funny because the director at the time she was very skeptical 
I let her sit in on some of the sessions we were doing and her and I were on the main floor and we were doing total quiet time where I had people in one room and everybody's in it. Um, can see someone at least visually from a distance. So it's for safety reasons. And so everybody was spread out and we went total quiet for a half hour. And, and during that time, our meter started going crazy and, and her and I were sitting at the bottom of the stairs and she gasped and I said, you okay? And she she goes, there's a man standing at the end of the hallway there. She goes, I can see a solid black mass. They had a thermostat on the wall and she said the light from it just totally vanished. That's what got her attention. Then she saw a head and shoulders standing there looking at her. And she became a believer then. And for my listeners that don't know, Ripa Villa is uh, Ripa Villa Mansion in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Um, it was completed in 1855, built by Nathaniel Francis Shears the Fourth, and uh, it is now a a tourist attraction. You can go tour it, and they do quite a few uh, public events there as well. Yeah, they they have uh, I think uh, public ghost events there. I think like every three months or something like that. Whispers of the past, I think they call it. And you've investigated there many, many times. So I'm sure you've yeah, got many, many, many times. stories. And it's great, you know, when I have witnesses there. Like we had a reporter from the Dixon Herald come with us one time. And he had done stories on other teams and about haunted locations, but never experienced anything. And we were down in the cellar. And I told him, I said, I did a public event with uh, the TV show host, Patrick Burns, um, where they investigated uh, murder scenes and stuff like that and try to connect it with paranormal. And uh, I had a family of five down in the cellar where we witnessed a full body apparition appear in front of us. So I was telling him about that. So when he was down there, all, all the my motion lights were going off. The natural EMF tri-field was going off. And he had a satchel bag slung over his shoulder that carried, you know, extra papers and pens and that for his reporting. And he thought one of us had grabbed his bag that it lifted up in the air and then fell against him. And, and then he got tugged a couple of times that that spooked him. And that and witnessing, you know, sparks of light. We used to see this a lot at Ripa Villa. Sparks would just pop in the air, real bright flashes of uh, sparks. And uh, we had motion lights. We had three motion lights out in front of us, and they would come on on command, you know, saying, can you go over and touch the left one? And the left one would turn on, and we're like, all right, can you go all the way over to the right and turn that one on? And the middle one would stay off, and then all of a sudden the right one would go off. You know, he was just like, you know, speechless. He was in shock that he witnessed all that. That it's interesting that you you talk about the sparks of light because this past weekend when I was at Lowe's house as a guest investigator, I saw something similar to that uh, in one of the upstairs bedrooms over the bed. And the only way I could describe it at the time to the people I was with um, was it looked like a very faint sparkler, like a Fourth of July sparkler. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and so I think that's cool that you you have seen that too because I had never seen or heard about anything like that. Um, and it was a very interesting experience and it just happened for a brief second, but the room was dark. So there was nothing to emit that type of light, um, except for yeah. there's a little bit of light coming in the window, but there was nothing to reflect that type of light or, or to have that effect of like that sparkler effect. Um, yeah, we've seen them at the, at the Columbia high school I investigated where we would see sparks of red and silver. And sometimes they would like pop in the air. You would see them illuminate. And they would hang like float across the air and you could see like a, a like a comet tail behind it. And then it would just vanish. And uh, we ended up capturing when we were investigating the library of the high school, one of those red balls of light. Literally, we're doing an EVP session, unaware of this. And on the video camera, you see this red ball of light floating into the library, it goes behind this pole, comes back around the pole and then goes right past us again and goes out the side door. And uh, I got a video of that on our YouTube channel. It's pretty amazing. Wow, that's some, that's some awesome evidence, especially when you're when you're. It's the perfect time that you actually have a camera to catch it because there's so much stuff. You know this as well as I do with investigating. That you know, you, there's times where you got to change out batteries or you're taking a break and stuff will happen and you're just right. not recording. And it sometimes it's some of the most amazing stuff and you're like, man, why can't I just record every second? You know, but that's kind right. of impossible. Yeah. Yeah, I've had multiple cameras. All of a sudden, you're witnessing something, and all the batteries are dead. And you're like, really? Yeah. <laughs> right now? <laughs> <laughs> and then also, um, you worked at the Clement Railroad Museum and Hotel in Dixon, Tennessee? Yeah, I worked there for three and a half years. Um, they opened in 2009, and um, I started there in August of 2009. And I started off as a volunteer uh, docent, L later on uh, became a curator, and helped put some of 
uh, exhibits together. I put like the largest exhibit they ever had. There was a World War II exhibit that we did for the 70th anniversary of, of World War II. And that was amazing. When we brought in all that, all these people were loaning their artifacts from their family members and that the museum really amped up. We had a lot of activity and, um, I'd be working there trying to put exhibits together and I'd be there all by myself. The whole building's locked up and I'm there early in the morning and I would put on uh 1940 swing music, Glenn Miller, and that'd be blaring on the radio. And all of a sudden I would hear talking in the hallways. I heard doors opening, start hearing footsteps coming towards me, towards the room I'm working at thinking someone, oh, someone must be here to help out and I turn off the radio and go out there and there's nobody in the hallway. <laughs> But that place was extremely active. And when I first started there, people are like, oh, there's no they they learned that I was into paranormal research. And, and the director there was very skeptic at the time. And she's like, you know, there's nothing happens here. No one's reported anything. Well, then all of a sudden, you know, she saw an apparition of a man uh, walk you know, into one of the rooms and she went to go check and nobody was there. Um, my first experience there was when I was closing up and they had a, a mock hotel room there that was all decor from like the 1920s period and I'm turning off all the lights and I go to that room to turn off the light and they have this window on the left side of the room and the curtain literally blows up in the air over the bed. It was like someone grabbed it by the corners and then just lifted it 10 feet in the air and was holding it. And I go, well, that's a serious draft. I'm like, what the hell? And then it just slowly dropped back down and I said, must be a draft. So I go down there and talk to the director and I said, hey, that window. And she goes, oh, it's a fake window. That's, you know, the, there's a glass window there. Yeah. But behind it is concrete. There's there's no way for a draft to be there. <laughs> and and she goes, especially that much of a draft where it would, would raise the curtain. Right. So then she starts admitting and other staff members are saying that room, they would come in in the morning to open and they would see an indent in the bed like someone had slept in the bed. And they had uh, a suitcase with clothes and they would put the clothes out on this chair. So it looked like someone was staying there and that their clothes were ready to be put on for the next day. And they would come in in the morning and those clothes were always on the floor. They were, they would be removed from the chair and they finally just gave up and just left the clothes in an open suitcase display instead of draping them on the chair. And then uh, later on, People start seeing a guy in coveralls that was like real dirty looking. The best way they describe him is like the cartoon character Bluto from uh, Popeye. And he was real gruffy. He would just growl at people and go Ugh, and walk in the room. And they're like, is there a problem? Is everything OK? And they go check in the room and nobody's there. And then um, other one was the train room that model trains would be moved and nobody be in there. Um, they have electrical switches that are underneath the table that light up the, the model buildings. And, uh, one night I was closing with one of the directors there and we went by that room multiple times while we were working on something for an event. And I look in the, I went by the room and I said, Whoa, the room's all lit up. And it wasn't like totally bright. It was just, you know, you see this glow. And she's like, yeah, it hasn't been like that since we've been up here. And I, I, so we go in there and all the buildings are lit up. And she's like, they were off earlier. I know because I locked the door. And I said, well, they're on now. And it's a toggle switch. It's not like something a, a mouse could hit. I mean, you got to put a lot of force, you know, to turn that on. So yeah. that was shocking. And then we had a re uh, an elevator repairman was pretty funny. He came up and goes, hey, is this place haunted? <laughs> and we're like, why? He goes, well, I'm working on the elevator on the second floor. And uh, and he saw the Bluto guy. He said, he, this guy just stepped out of the room and looked at me. And I looked at him and said, what's up? And he wouldn't answer me. <laughs> and he goes, and, and I go, uh, I'm supposed to be here. I'm working on the elevator. And the guy just like did this gruff, you know, growl at him and then stepped back into the room. And he's like, well, I didn't want any trouble with the guy. So I went down there to see what his deal was. And when I looked in the room, nobody was there. <laughs> so he had that experience. And then we had a docent that quit. She was in the gift shop and she heard some noise coming from the candy table. And uh, we had this wooden doll that you stuck lollipops in. And all of a sudden she witnessed one of the lollipops pull out of the wooden doll and levitate in the air and float across the room. And like they were walking out of the room, but they got to the wall and the sucker couldn't go through the wall. So the, the lollipop candy fell to the floor. 
And she let out a scream and ran out the door. And everybody's like, what's up with her? <laughs> and then later they found out, you know, she shared her experience. And she's like, I'm never coming back there. But there's so many experiences there. It's, it's amazing. You know, I've seen full body apparitions there. Um, people witnessed a ghost cat. Solid as can be. One of the curator's sons was there. And uh, he walked in the dining hall and saw a cat on the table. And he's like, oh, wow, who let you in? And the cat jumped off the table ran out of the dining room and he witnessed it go right through the wall and uh, other people on tours have asked you guys have a cat and um we're like no we don't have a cat here and they go i swore i just felt the cat come up and rub against my leg while we're doing tours you know with guests and we're like no no cat so it, that place is very interesting we had a lot of uh spirits uh we did i bought an ovulus a px model from bill chapel and it has a vocabulary of, I think it was like 2,400 words. Several times we had the name Clement come through it. And that's not even in the vocabulary. And it's when we're asking, can you tell us your name? And it goes Clement. Yeah. And that, that blew away the director when she heard that. In the, the Clement Museum, it's named after a, um, a governor of Tennessee, Frank G. Clement. Correct. Yeah. Frank was uh, born there in um, 1920. And uh, his parents uh, worked there. Um, his mom started working there with her, her mother in 1917, and she met Frank's dad, Robert, and they got married, and they ended up running the hotel for a while. And then they moved to uh, Kentucky and later came back in the 70s and bought the building and made it into a, a, a res residential place on the second floor. And they had a small tribute museum on the uh, main floor of Frank. Uh, Frank was killed in a car accident in 69, and uh, I've had the name come through Frank when we asked who's there. Um, say Frank Clement. We've also had Robert, you know, his name come through, but we've had female voices come through a little kid. Um, one of the amazing ones I had was one of the, I was closing up for the night, the curator I was working with, he was leaving to go home. So I told him, I said, well, I'm going to do a quick EVP session before I lock up. And he was whistling as he was going out the door. So I tagged my recorder and I go, Derek's whistling. And then clear as day here, this little boy goes, Derek's whistling. <laughs> that's pretty awesome especially when you yeah. get those clear voices like that where yeah you know, there's no question what they what what was said we got one um one of the first investigations we did we were up on the second floor and we decided to take a break so we left two millimeters on chairs with a, a digital recorder next to each millimeter and the millimeters you can hit record and walk away and see and then come back and check and see if you have an emf spike so we were down in the dining hall on the first floor and we came back and we had these uh, I think it was like a 2.5 EMF spike while we were gone. And so we tagged it and said, you know, listen to your recorders during the time period we're gone to this moment and see if there's anything. And sure enough, one recorder had nothing. And then the other recorder had this female's voice that was so loud and clear. And it sounded like she was looking over the stair rail and she's saying they're not going anywhere. I shared that on Facebook. And there was an organization out of Ohio called the Avalon Foundation. They were sound specialists. And they said, there's no way that's an EVP. It's just so clear. And they asked, you know, can we try to analyze it? And I think it was like three or four months later, they sent a 10-page written report with spectral analysis. And they said that the octaves is, is not from a human. So that, that, that was pretty awesome. They said, yeah, that's definitely not a, a, a person saying that, a living person at least. Right. And that, that's pretty cool to have that evidence of, of a scientific organization like that, you know, given their professional opinion, it, it definitely yeah. back, backs your evidence up a lot more. Yeah. This, that place has been very, very active. It's, it's been pretty amazing, you know, and there's just so many witnesses there that have, you know, witnessed activity there. And, and from all different time periods, you know, they've seen people, you know, in early 1800s, I mean, late 1800s close to um, almost modern, I would say probably 1960s time period close there. Yeah, and one of the right. cool things about Dixon, Tennessee, is that the downtown is still really original. Um, a lot of the buildings are old, old buildings, and they just kind of kept yes. them original. And it's it's kind of getting rare nowadays for those those small town downtowns like that to to be kept so original with the original buildings. And and I just I find yeah. it fascinating with the old brick, and and it just gives kind of a charm and a feel. Yeah, the Holbrook Hotel originally on that land there was the Dixon Hotel, which was built in 1873 when Dixon was being created. It used to be called Smedesville, and then it became Dixon. Um, there was two Smeeds, and that was messing up with the mail, so they ended up renaming it Dixon. Yeah, I think Dixon and, Dixon's better than Smedesville. 
<laughs> yeah, I agree. Hallbrook, JT Hallbrook, he came to Dixon and he was a banker and he ended up uh, buying several buildings. And one of them was the Dixon Hotel, which was it was wood constructed at the time. And he tore that down and put in, you know, the Hallbrook, which was very modern for its time. They had, you know, uh, heating throughout the rooms and uh, electricity. And uh, they opened up in 1913. And then Frank's mother and father, they came in there in 1917 and worked there for a while. But yeah, a lot of cool history. The hotel was originally made for uh, salesmen that uh, brought in uh, items to sell to the local farmers and that. And it was mainly for hotel, uh, for railroad workers because Dixon was a, a big hub for a uh, railroad. Right now, there's only one track going through there, but there was multiple tracks that used to be downtown Dixon. They actually had a turn wheel down there with multiple tracks to change out trains and cars and stuff. It used to be a popular place at one time. And the Clement Railroad Museum is open for, for tours and people can go down there and see it for themselves and, and see some of the places, yeah. like the, some of the rooms you were talking about, the different rooms they got with the different exhibits. Yeah, there's some great exhibits. They they have a lot of history of the Dixon County itself. Um, Dixon didn't have any like major battles like the Battle of Franklin. There was a Union camp in uh, Charlotte, and then you had like uh, Union soldiers uh, putting in the railroad at that time going through Dixon. And due to the railroad being put in there, that's why... You know, downtown Dixon was created. It was closer to the rails and everything, and that's how Dixon was created. But prior to that was just, you know, Charlotte, which was north of it. There was a Union camp there. You can find all kinds of artifacts there. And that that town's like, very active with activity. Um, years ago, before I started uh, BSPR, there was a team here in Dixon, and, and I was with another team in Nashville. And um, they had done a story on them in the local paper, so I contacted them, and they invited me to go to the Charlotte jailhouse and the Charlotte jailhouse um, was built in 1830 and was an active jail till like the 1970s. The mayor of the town of Charlotte at the time had asked this team to go in there and invest, you know, to investigate. And I was able to go in there. I think it was five investigations I did there. And every time it was extremely active, but I'll never forget the first time I went there, I saw full body apparitions. I don't know if it was like a portal of time but I was going um, to set up my cameras and I was going up to the second floor and I was going up the stairs and I just totally froze and looked to my left. And there by the fireplace was two boys and a little girl playing marbles on the floor. And it was like they felt me there and they just turned their heads and looked right at me. And, I, you know, my, I gasped and they just suddenly vaporized and vanished. And I was like, holy crap, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know this place is really active. And um, there was one time we knocked on the door. I said, oh, I'd like to introduce ourselves before we go in. So it was just my wife and I and the, the team leader of the team and the rest of the members had gone to the, the grocery store to get some water and snacks. So I said, well, let's just not just walk in. Let's knock on the door and then open it and say, hello, is anybody home? And so we unlock the door and I knock on it and open the door and I go, hello, is anybody home? And also we heard this woman's voice from the kitchen goes, hello. <laughs> <laughs> And the, and the other team leaders, I got huge and she's like, uh, no one should be in there. And she goes, who's in there? And we didn't get an answer and we searched the whole house. We couldn't find anyone, but, uh, yeah, it was extremely active. One of the times, uh, I was so mad. I thought my wife didn't hit record on our, I had a mini DVD recorder, you know, camera. And we were having on the jail cell door. I had two motion lights and I said, yes, turn on this lamp for yes. And turn on this one for no. And for like 15 minutes, we were asking questions and the lights were interacting with the question. And I'm like, this is amazing. And then I go to check and there's no recording on the DVD at all. And I thought she didn't hit record until I reviewed my audio and you could hear the camera chime when you hit the record button. And so after that, I decided I'm going full hard drive cameras, no more <laughs> DVD. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the jail cell, I got an amazing class a evp there where i sat in the jail cell and had my back to the wall and i'm talking and all of a sudden i felt this big paw of a hand grabbing me by the back of the neck and i'm freaking out i'm like whoa this is not nice everybody's like you okay and i'm like yeah i'm being touched i feel someone grab me by the neck and i finally just said okay i'm leaving and i'm leaving the jail cell and you hear this man's voice calling me a chicken as i'm going out the door <laughs> <laughs> um, some of my favorite stuff is the call and response stuff. Like you were talking about with the lights and having a conversation. Of course, you know, it, if you're, uh, you know, when I investigate my team, medics for paranormal, of course we want to see, you know, 
catch full body apparitions, that type stuff. But right. some of the most interesting fun and funnest stuff is when you're getting that call and response, whether it's with the K2 or with a REM pod and getting, you know, that, that intelligent interaction, because that gets you to know the person, the entity, the spirit that you're talking to. So that, that just makes the night so much fun, especially when you have that interaction. I got a great video of that on YouTube uh, at the Clement Railroad Museum. Deborah Cat, she's a psychic, and she's written quite a few books on how to be a psychic and medium. Um, she came out from California, and uh, I was doing a paranormal event to raise money for the museum. And her class, she bought out the whole event. And we were doing an interaction in the parlor room on the main floor of the museum. And I had one of those ghost meters that blinks and makes a little beeping noise. And you know, we were saying blink once for no and twice for yes. And we had a full half hour session going on. And then we had the ovulus on at the same time. There was words that, you know, match with that when we said, you know, how many are here? The ovulus would say seven. And I'm like looking around, I go, holy crap, there's seven of us sitting here. And, and then where it goes, wow, you're really good with math. And then it blinks twice for yes. <laughs> <laughs> so a good session with interaction. And for any listeners that want to go check out any of your videos, they can just search uh, VS Paranormal as one word on YouTube. And you've got a lot of videos up there of of a lot of evidence and interactions. Um, And also, yeah, they can go on Facebook and and check out your Facebook, too, under uh, Volunteer State Paranormal. Yeah, main website, too. i got a website. You've also – I interviewed uh, Deborah from Octagon Hall, and you've had quite a few uh, investigations and experiences up there as well. Yeah, I've investigated there 18 times since, uh, I think, either 2006 or 2007. It was my first time going there. And um, I think it was about two years ago was the last time I went there. The last time I went there, um, we, and I don't know what was there. It definitely wasn't nice. Um, Fried my laptop and I went through five voice recorders and a motion light. They were all fried and it was crazy. And the team saw, uh, we were up in the main bedroom upstairs where they have now a new bed that's a canopy bed that was uh, donated. And they said uh, they saw a ball of light about the size of a golf ball go right through me. And when it went through me, I could, it felt like I stuck my finger in a wall outlet and my whole body just shook. I was like, whoa. And my, my, uh, digital recorder died when that happened. Prior to it, I went through four recorders. It just kept on killing the batteries and I put new batteries in and the recorders wouldn't work. And I had a motion light that just fried the insides of that. And, uh, in the past, I had a trap camera. We had it in that room. And we're doing an EVP session. Someone goes, do you smell smoke? And my trap camera almost caught on fire. It started smoking out of it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, and I'm like, it's battery operated. It's not even plugged in a wall. Outlet. I go, what? And, the, and it fried the trap camera. So the place has cost me a lot in equipment, but I've seen some pretty amazing stuff. Um, I was up in the attic and I had a an arm and a hand appear next to me. And the arm had uh, a wolf sleeve that was gray in color. So it was like a partial manifestation and, uh, several people witnessed, uh, sparks of light popping in front of us. And I had, I was up there with two girls and they had their hair tugged and pulled lower up there. And, um, I was trying to get his attention prior to me seeing the arm appear. Um, I said, you know, I'm ex-military. I was a sergeant front and center soldier, you know, show yourself. And I was wearing a ball cap and I felt like someone hit me in the back of the head with their back end of their hand there and about knocked my hat off. Yeah, it's it's pretty active place. Octagon Hall is pretty amazing. I'm going to be up there with my team um, the week of Halloween, actually, the 25th and 26th. We're going to be there for two days. So I'm kind of excited, but like I've heard all this all this crazy, you know, stuff, too. So I'm like eh, a little apprehensive because, you know, you don't want to get attacked or or, you know, some of the more negative stuff that I've heard. But I think it'll be fun. Right. It'll be good. A good two days of investigating. And hopefully with us being there two days, you know, we catch a lot more stuff, too. The barn, um, we've had some amazing results. Um, I did a public event up there one time. I was a guest speaker. And this lady purchased tickets for her husband. He was uh, Special Forces out of Fort Campbell, and he had just came back from tour. So he wasn't really too excited to be there. And he's like, well, cemetery is supposed to be active, right? And I said, well, yeah, we've had some experiences out there with motion lights. I actually had a, a motion alarm. We had it on the, had these slat rail fences. I'm not sure if he still has them up there, but there was a slat rail fence by the cemetery and I placed it up there and I was watching shadow figures off to my left and my team to the right all suddenly scream and gasp. And I'm like, what? And they go, the motion alarm just lifted off the fence and disappeared. 
and you could hear it chiming out in the field and it was thrown about 10 or 15 feet out in the field. Wow. Yeah. I'm sitting there. I, when I hear, I'm hearing it chiming and I said, no, it must've fell off the rail, you know, in the darkness, you think it got lifted or something. And they're like, no, we saw it lift up in the air and thrown. So I'm going out there with a flashlight. I'm looking around the fence thinking it's going to be laying on the ground next to the rail. And then I'm hearing it chiming quite a ways out. And I'm like, no way. I said, that definitely didn't fall off the fence. I was like, how the hell did that get out there? So that, that was pretty amazing experience, you know, witnessing that. But the Green Beret, um, nothing happened in the cemetery. So I said, hey, look, we've had EVPs of soldiers out in the barn. I'll take you out there. So I went and got some motion lights and a vintage tin mug and some Kentucky bourbon in a little, like one of those single shot bottles, you know, and uh, went out there and I set up the motion lights in the natural EMF tri-field and, and had him introduce himself by his rank and try to make a connection with the soldiers and I introduced myself. And I said, well, if you're here, can you turn on the lanterns? All of, I think I had three or four motion lights and all of them turned on at the same time. And he's like, no way. You got a remote control in your pocket or something setting that off. I said, no, I don't. I mean, you can pat me down. So I said, well, thank you for turning on the lights. We'll crack open the bottle and I'll pour it here in this cup. Feel free to come up and have a snort, you know, kind of you know, try to talk the lingo of the time. So all of a sudden he goes, the trifield meter that we had in front of us, that starts pegging. And then he's like, oh, my God, do you smell that? And I said, yeah, it's really nasty. He's like, yeah, it smells like someone hasn't taken a shower in probably weeks, you know, like soldiers in the field kind of deal. And I said, yeah. And all of a sudden I look at the table behind us and I said, check out the mug. And I had placed a K2 on top of the mug and it was pegging all the way to right, you know, to the red. And he's like, oh, my God. I said, yep. <laughs> I said, I've, every time I've gone out in the barn and done that, it's worked. So pretty amazing. Yeah, and it's kind of neat to use sugar objects like that and, and also speak the lingo of the time because it connects you with those spirits. Uh, and I think it makes them feel more comfortable, too, with you. Yeah, I agree. We went out there um, one time in the barn and we played poker and I purposely cheated and palmed some aces and didn't say, you know say anything. And then everybody's like, you know, Mike, I, I said during the games, make sure you count the cards every time we turn in. And um I turned in six cards instead of five. So I cheated and they asked the spirits, what do you think of cheaters? And I got whacked in the back of the head. I felt like <laughs> a hand hit me in the head. That was pretty neat. And then one time Octagon Hall had a para unity event where they invited all these teams to come up there and they had John Zappas there on Friday and Chris Lean from Paranormal State on Saturday. And we were there Saturday with Chris Lean. And um I brought a bouquet of flowers and uh I brought that to put in the kitchen to thank, you know, the gift for the female spirits of the house there and put my K2 next to the bouquet of flowers and said, hopefully you communicate with us tonight. And uh, the K2 lit up, you know, by the flowers. And uh, and then in the barn, I usually do bourbon for the soldiers out there. And I've also done coffee. Sometimes coffee works. Um, but uh, when I did that public event there, I had one of my team members who was a recording artist. He played a Civil War song for us on his guitar. And I told everyone, I said, when he finishes a song, don't applause. And we had five K2 spread out through the room. And we said, uh, if you like the music, that was a tribute to you guys for talking to us throughout the night, you know, and our way of saying thanks. And uh, if you appreciated the music, feel free to light up the lights there. And all five K2s lit to red at the same time. And everybody's like gasping, like, whoa. <laughs> so, yeah, I like doing like, you know, trigger objects and interacting. Usually do pretty good with that. And also the um, talking about Octagon Hall, the episode of Most Terrifying Place in America that you're on was centered around Octagon Hall. Correct. Yes. Um, I talked about an experience we had in the kitchen, uh, the winter kitchen there in the cellar. Um, we had witnessed uh, the pot on the hook totally swing out on its own. And um, someone goes, oh, it's got to be a draft or something. Well, the fireplace was totally enclosed. There was no way for a strong draft to do that. And uh, we had an EVP of uh, sounded like a, a lady from the islands, you know, she had like that Jamaican type accent. And um, I, I said, did you move the pot near this woman goes, I'm cooking. But yeah, we've been out. We've seen the gourds banging against the walls that are in the kitchen. We've seen them move. We've seen shadow movement down there. We've seen people be in touch, motion lights coming on when we ask them to turn them on. Very rarely I've ever gone there and nothing's happened. 
And most of it's, you know, usually positive. Rarely, you know, like I said, the last time I went there was with the equipment and that was a rare experience. I was really surprised to have all that stuff happen. Then link linked to the new stuff that came in. That's what my theory was. It might have been, you know, the lady that owned the stuff and just wasn't happy there. Yeah. And and my theory is, you know, it, it, I think they know your intentions coming in. And especially if you're respectful and you make that right. known that, you know, we're coming in here just to chat with you and we respect your home and we understand this is your home. And, you know, but, but yeah, if you come in there with ill intentions and me and Deborah kind of talked about it on the episode of about Octagon Hall, about they had something nasty come in there and, and they had to deal with it. Because, you know, people don't always come in there with the best of intentions. And, and you've got lots right. of people that, that have paranormal groups that want to use, you know, Ouija boards and conjuring and open up, you know, these things yeah, that they have good. no business dealing with. So out of all the, out of all the years of you investigating, what, what place do you think was your favorite to investigate? Ripaville is one of my favorites. I, you know, I made a connection with the spirits there. I've actually had them follow me home. <laughs> and show up in my house. My wife one night got woken up by Nathaniel, um, gave her a scare, and I showed her a picture of Nathaniel. I said, did he look like this? And she's like, oh, my God, that's the guy. And she about pushed me out of the bed trying to get away. Um, she woke up, and he was hovering right above her and uh, looking down at her with his long gray beard. And uh, I've seen, I believe, who was Susan wearing a green dress standing at the end of my bed and next to my bed several times. And, um, I've been contacted, you know, several times through visions and dreams that they showed me stuff that I didn't even know existed and later talking to the docents there and they're like, yeah, that exists. I'm like, well, I was unaware of that, but that's what they showed me in the dream. I was like, wow. <laughs> uh, what do you think is, uh, we've, we've talked about a lot today, but what do you think is the coolest experience you've ever had in the paranormal? The most amazing experience I probably had besides my, you know, my dad, uh, coming back to life there. Um, was in 2012 here at my house and, uh, I was woken up about six o'clock in the morning. I could see someone on my front porch through my bedroom window. And I'm like, who, who's, who's that on my porch this early in the morning? So I threw on some pants, went up to the front door, opened it up. And I look outside and to my left, I see this woman with her back towards me and she's, uh, she's crying. And I go, is everything okay? And she turned around and it was my grandmother, my dad's mom. And I was in shock and she's like, I'm so sorry how I treated you. You know, will you please forgive me? Now, when my dad died in 94, we had called her to tell her that he had passed away. And she said, you know, thanks for letting me know. There's no reason to stay in touch now that he's passed away. And I was like, wow, I'm your grandson. I would hope we would stay in touch. And she's like, no, there's no reason. You know, you're a grown adult now. And, and uh, I said, well, that's, that's just crazy. We're family, you know. And, She's like, there's no need. And she hung up. She wouldn't take calls back and uh, try to write her letters and birthday cards and Christmas cards and never heard from her. And so she asked for forgiveness. And I said, yeah, I forgive you. So she reached out for a hug and I hugged her and I could feel her clothes, her body and her hugging me. And then all and I felt this most amazing feeling of love come over me. And then um, she turned into this bright white light that was so bright. I had to close my eyes. It was so intense. And then I could feel her energy going and the light dimming and she was gone. And I'm standing there on my porch with my arms out, like I'm hugging someone, but nobody's there. And then I'm looking around like, oh, crap, are the neighbors out? Are they seeing this? You know, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. did they just witness this? And uh, so I'm in shock and I, I go back in the house and I go back in the bedroom there and I lay down on the bed and, and my wife had woken up. And she's like, hey, is everything OK? And I said. I don't know. I don't, you know, I'm like in shock. And she goes, what happened? I said, I think I just had a talk with my grandmother. And she was like in shock. She's like, well, let me go make some coffee in that and uh, we'll discuss it. So she gets up. I try to get out of bed and I just suddenly got so dizzy and lightheaded. I, you know, fell over and hit my nightstand and hit the floor hard. And, um, for two days, I was so lightheaded and dizzy. And I talked to some of my medium psychic friends and they were all saying, yeah, your body was not used to her energy. And um, your body was trying to readjust. And they go, after that happened, you should have talked, you know, took a shower to wash off that energy and ate some chocolate and grounded yourself. And I'm like, well, I've never had this ever happen before. It's pretty intense. 
And my grandmother had been dead for seven years. So. <laughs> wow. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. I mean, she was solid as a, you know, a, you know, a, a living person. I've, you know, I felt her hug me and, and I could feel her clothes, her hair and her frail body when I hugged her. So that was probably, you know, one of the top most amazing experiences I've had. So, um, we, we've kind of talked about it throughout the, out the show here, but if people want to, uh, check out your evidence and, and check out, um, volunteer state paranormal research, they can go to your website, vsparanormal.com or on YouTube, um, to look up the evidence videos and that t- type stuff on VS paranormal, uh, on YouTube. And then also on your Facebook page, just volunteer state paranormal research. What do you and the group have coming up, uh, in the, in the foreseeable future? Well, right now, um, due to the COVID thing, um, we haven't done much this year, sadly. I am, a, I'm guest speaking for the Clarksville, um, Rotary Club come October and hopefully some other stuff. We, I, I work with a medium out of Nashville and last year we did a seance event and it was a great night. It was a lot of activity and a lot of great personal experiences during the seance. Um, so her and I were, you know, we're hoping in the future to do another one. Once we get hopefully past this COVID thing that we can do public events like that. But uh, so far, just the, the Rotary Club I got going. But um, hopefully some more. So everybody just keep a eye out on your on your Facebook page and on your yeah. on your website. I think that's about all we got time for today. I appreciate you coming on. You've been a great guest and I, it's, I've enjoyed our conversation. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed it, too. And thanks for asking me to be a guest. I enjoyed it. No problem at all. And I'd love to have you on again in the future when you do some more investigations and and talk about some more uh, evidence and and locations. Yeah, I'd be happy to. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll see you next time on The Unseen Paranormal. Have a good day. Join us next time for a new episode of The Unseen Paranormal. Until then, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or at our website, unseenparanormalpodcast.com. And don't forget to like, review, rate, and share with all your friends. Thank you to my friend Chris Lips for the awesome theme music. Listen to our theme song and more of his music at chrislipsmusic.com. And remember, some of the scariest things are unseen. <laughs>